All right, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's podcast. Today we're going to be discussing the Congress of Vienna and the Congress system, which continues afterwards. Um, in the long run, um, this period of time is really marking from 1814 to um, the 1850s, 1860s, um, where this Congress system is sort of a first attempt for Europe to European powers to sort of stabilize and um, create peace through negotiation and meetings. Um, so just a little bit of background um, as a preview to the Congress itself. Um, we're going to go back to and remind ourselves about Napoleon, where we came from. So um, uh, after the failed Russian campaign for Napoleon, there was um, one final massive battle called the Battle of Nations at, in Leipzig, Germany in October of 1813. Um, this is going to be the greatest number of men in battle at one time until the 20th century. A massive scale of battle. Um, and then the Russian victory in this battle, along with its participation during the campaign to Moscow, is going to make Russia seem like a really great power to the other European powers. And it's really um, for the first time when Europe, Russia it appears to be a dominant power to the rest of Europe. Now, how much that is true, um, like a real power versus how much was just chance and luck um, is conflicted, but but Russia is going to walk away being able to claim I am the power, the only power that was able to defeat Napoleon outright. Um, so with this, um, Napoleon is going to surrender, which is ending a quarter century of continual warfare in Europe. And it's at this point that the Bourbon monarchy is going to be restored into France. Um, and so um, the stages that led to this, originally there was a meeting in Frankfurt that was actually trying to negotiate a peace with Napoleon. He refused um, to accept this peace negotiation. Um, so then um, the great powers formed what's called the Quadruple Alliance, which was um, the Grand Alliance of Russia, Prussia, Austria, and Great Britain. Um, and they, they meet and they gather together in 1814, creating a formalized, truly unified, for the first time in Napoleon's time, when they're all four great powers really consolidated together um, in with the efforts of defeating Napoleon. And they meet, and, and Napoleon then is forced to abdicate on April 4th, 1814. So when Napoleon um, abd abdicates, the um, the Allies are going to all enter Paris, and they will restore Louis the Eighteenth to the throne. Now, uh, this is all based on Tally, Tally, um, Talleyrand's theory and principle of legitimacy that there needs to be a legitimate heir to the throne, and that will give that person in power. Um, a proper rule. Um, the people of France were conflicted as to what kind of ruler they wanted. Some actually saw um, Napoleon's infant son as, as a fair option for them to rule. Others really demanded that republic to maintain, but Talleyrand was really able to convince the people um, and then the other foreign powers that what would be in the best interest of France and all of Europe would be restore the Bourbon monarchy to the throne. Um, but when Louis XVIII does come into the throne, he does issue a constitution, um, although he perceived it and he tried to frame it as a way of it's a gift of the monarchy to the people. Um, so still an absolutist rule making a choice to share this constitution with his people. But in reality, it really did meet a lot of the demands of the people themselves. So um, this constitutional charter promised legal equality for all people. It actually preserved the Napoleonic law code. Um, it maintained the same relationship with the church that Napoleon had set up, that Concordat of 1801, and abolished feudalism formally. Um, any land claims that were redistributed and property rights that were redistributed during the, during the revolution um, that Napoleon had preserved, he also continued to maintain. So really what Louis XVIII is able to do is provide some kind of continuity um, for the French people and stability. He's not really changing much. Um, however, those nobles that are returning with him, the emigre, they are starting to cause trouble. And we see um, different pockets of what we call the white terror, where these nobles are trying to get revenge on their actions. And so although Louis XVIII is imposing much of a threat, 
um, these other groups are. And that's actually um, when Napoleon returns from Elba after those first um, and rules for those next hundred days. One of the reasons why he's able to have such um, widespread support from the people um, is because, not because of Louis the Eighteenth being unpopular, but because of some of these other actions nobility were doing at this time. But at any rate, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. Um, on May 30th, 1814, um, so before Napoleon returns from Elba, um, there is the first um, there is the first meeting of um, of of the Congress of Vienna, and this is the first treaty um, where there's purposely really not punishing France, and that's what Talleyrand is another strength that he was able to achieve, is we're not going to be punishing France, um, France's borders are returned to the border size from 1792. Um, there's also no indemnity. Um, France doesn't owe any money to the other countries. They don't need to pay for the cost of the war, um, and Napoleon gets exiled to Elba. He's not executed, he's not threatened in any way, you know, he's just exiled to another island, not allowed to rule. But then when Napoleon is able to escape from Elba and return to France, he's able to gather an army, head back, and he actually attacks Belgium, which is part of 1795 France, so um, not a part of the borders that were maintained under Fran under this first treaty. Um, um, and it's at this moment that they have the Battle of Waterloo, which is in modern-day um, modern Belgium. And um, the Duke of Wellington from England is able to help organize this victory. And Napoleon is then exiled, as we learned, to St. Helena. Um, so then the second treaty for Paris and for France is going to be much harsher. Um, yes, it once again reestablishes the Bourbon rule, the Bourbon monarchy. Um, but there's, l there's, there's less... Um, compliance with the desires of republic, um, republicanism there. Um, there's also going to be a military occupation of France by foreign powers. Um, they will now be charged a fee. It's not an exorbitant fee, but they are charged an indemnity. And there's a reconfiguration of that quadruple alliance, which was helped, which helped force the abdication of Napoleon. Um, and they really, they, they reconsolidated their power to agree to work together to prevent any future Bonaparte from ever ruling France again. Um, so this group of four countries, the moment that they were able to force um, Napoleon to abdicate, they immediately start to distrust one another. And if, it, and if anything, um, Napoleon's return to France sort of reunites them and helps them negotiate for a much more lasting peace in Vienna to help really restore um, this, this period of order. So the Congress um, of Vienna was met um, in, uh, between 1814 to 1815 to help reestablish the old order, to help reestablish order in all of Europe, but really um, specifically the old regime to sort of return to the way it once was. Just as a note of how it was structured and, and what happened here, um, pretty much every single power of Europe, whether great or small, was included in Vienna. And this is really when we first, first start to hear the terms a great power, a small power, a lesser power, um, in terms of foreign policy and dynamics. Because even little tiny princes in the Holy Roman Empire that no longer existed on the map since Napoleon reconfigured the Holy Roman Empire came to Vienna with the hope that their privileges, their rights would be restored and they would once again regain their power in, um, it, um, in their region. Um, they're never going to be seen once in, in Vienna. Instead, it's really the four great powers that are going to be meeting, negotiating, and they're going to be the ones who really determine and dictate um, the borders and boundaries of Europe. Um, in addition to that, um, the culture and the lifestyle of Vienna at this time is infused with a reminder that to be noble is something special. It was very purposeful at this Congress of Vienna. They had balls um, regularly. Um, they had these golden chariots, which all the every leader from the small Holy Roman prince to the great power leaders uh, would be carted throughout Vienna with um, to sort of remind everyone what it means to be noble, the idea of this this old old regime and the, and the rites and rituals of it. Um, a lot of the pomp and circumstance was there to try and also restore and remind of what life was like 25, 30 years ago before the French Revolution began. So um, the primary concerns at this Congress of Vienna 
um, was one was um, to the return to the traditional balance of power. So um, equilibrium of polit political and military force um, in order to try and discourage any further aggression by any combination of states or the domination of any single state. So they wanted to make sure that no one power could ever be France, not France, but not this new power of Russia either. So they're trying to maintain a balance of power between these areas. In terms of compensation, they really are looking not for financial compensation, but in the form of, of um, territory. They want to make sure that they get the land um, that is worth their while for fighting and, and struggling against France. So for Great Britain, they're really looking for colonies, outposts that they had won during the war. Austria is going to be willing to give up certain areas, such as Belgium. Um, but in return, they want to be able to receive territory in southern Germany and in northern Italy. So to help expand their empire into one larger unit, one whole consolidated group, rather than pockets of power throughout Europe. And Russia is going to be looking at the area of Poland as another source, sort of shifting their power westward. Prussia, too, we'll look at a map later, is it going to be becoming a new real state power. And then finally, in terms of legitimacy, every ruler is going to want to make sure that that legitimate heir to the throne has true noble blood in their line. Um, no more of this revolution nonsense. Um, they want to make sure that each ruler is of noble blood and true monarchies are in power. Um, here are our key players at Vienna, and I'm just going to go through each person and what their um, main goals were for each one. So um, for uh, Russia, let's first start there. I like to describe Russia and Tsar Alexander I, sort of the big man on campus. Um, he is an interesting figure. Uh, he really is going to benefit a lot from defeating Napoleon, right? He's coming into this negotiation as a big power. He's also... Um, the, the only, one of the only rulers, the czar himself, was present at Vienna. Um, if you notice, so in England, they sent a representative, France sent a representative, Austria sent a representative. And so for the czar to be there helped push a lot of weight on him. Um, although the czar fought against Napoleon, he actually greatly admired a lot of the ideas and values that Napoleon was espousing. And so um, he's going to really be pushing for um, more enlightened ideas. So he'll actually call for constitutional governments. Um, he'll want collective security. Um, he actually is going to help support Prussia in getting Saxony, um, which will help benefit him because he really wants to restore Poland. Um, so Tsar Alexander views Poland as a nation that should exist. He does value nationalism, but he views Poland as a nation that should exist where he gets to be the king of it. So it would be an addi additional kingdom to his rule. And so he sees that as another extension, ending the partition of Poland, which he saw weakened Poland as well as weakened him and weakened Prussia and weakened Austria. He wants to recreate and maintain this Duchy of Warsaw, which was first created under, um, under Napoleon. Austria um, was led by Metternich. Now, um, Metternich is going to be given the nickname the Coachman of Europe. He is the host for all of this. Um, he is going to really help dictate a lot of the values, and he really structures this conservative mindset throughout um, throughout the different rulers. At the time, the word conservatism wasn't yet um, in the vernacular for anyone, but that was really the values that he then consolidates that other people start to put a label to. His goal was order and stability, a balance of power, and he is very fearful of nationalism. Austria, if you can recall, if you can envision, is made up of many different peoples. And so there was a great fear that, the, that by recognizing nationalistic desires in other areas, the Austrian Empire would collapse. And so um, he is um, he is really a, a fearful of the spread of liberal voices as well as nationalism in his own government. So he's going to try and limit that. Um, he does not want Prussia to gain any more power, so he's against giving Saxony to Prussia. In the same vein, he's, he does not want to give Poland to Russia. Um, but his main goal is going to be balance of power. So as a result, he is willing to give up um, the, the Habsburg ne Netherlands, which is modern day Belgium, what we call Belgium. Um, and he calls for that to be united with Holland or um, the, the Dutch Republic and form a new kingdom. And this new kingdom could then be a buffer against any encroaching power of France. 
Um, England is present, um, and England is, is led by the foreign minister, Kasselra. Uh, and he comes to Vienna, um, as he says, and, and I'll quote, not to collect trophies, but to establish peace. Um, later on, Wellington will actually be the man present at Vienna. Um, his main goal is really freedom of the seas, open trade, maintaining the colonial presence and power that England has been able to acquire. Um, a lot of what England gains is um, is is beyond uh, beyond Europe, um, and so this is really where um, England is is asserting itself as a global dominant power, and where the first strains of the British Empire really exist. Um, but it does, once again, also call for no Russian Poland, a united Holland and Belgium, um, and an established uh, balance of power. Now, France being present here um, is also calling for a balance of power. Um, and, and his main goal is to make sure that France can still be some form of a balance. And so he calls for a restoration of French territories and maintain, main, maintaining the powers of the monarchy in France. Um, so here's a map of the overall settlements. There's going to be a link in addition to this podcast that I want you to, um, to watch. It just sort of maps out how the different powers play out and how the map gets rearranged. But some things I just want to point out to you here is the idea of the, the establishment of different buffer states along the border of France to help counter that balance. So this new, ki this new kingdom of the Netherlands, which was made up of the Dutch Republic, which was greatly weakened at this point and really not even truly strong, any kind of valid kind of power, along with the Austrian Netherlands, um, to become this one kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, and it's the, the House of Orange that's going to become the kings of that, uh, in the noble line of, of that area. Um, this, there's also a new Piedmont Sardinia kingdom that gets bolstered up and um, helps strengthen. That's going to be another power to counterbalance France. And then Prussia, too, is given land along the Rhine and sort of is served and viewed to be a bridge to help bridge and counter the balance of power for both Russia and France. Sort of sort of this bridge across Western Europe. What this is going to do though is really extend the power of Prussia um, over all of the German Confederation. You recall uh, Napoleon had broken down the Holy Roman Empire and there was the rise of nationalism that resisted Napoleon um, in his rule in Germany and um, the idea of the Volkgeist and the common person. The Congress of Vienna ignores those nationalist desires um, but it does start to shift some people's values and they start to see Prussia as the potential unifying force. Um, in addition to that, the rest of the German Confederation remains separate. Um, however, uh, instead of being princes and some kind of elector system for the Holy Roman Empire, each of those um, different um, regions that Napoleon had divided up now becomes independent kingdoms, and they maintain their uh, their their independence. So, um, a kingdom of Bavaria becomes quite strong um, in the early 19th century, and uh, that's where you have Munich being the the capital of it. And um, if you are at all familiar with um, like the castle of Disney World, it's um, under these kings during this last like 50 years of rule um, in, in Bavaria that you have these castles being constructed by a, a crazy King Ludwig um, out of this kingdom that he's able to acquire there and, and center of trade. Um, one area that becomes really a, a, a big point of question is Poland and Saxony. What's to be done with these two? So it's known as the Polish Saxon qu um, question. Um, Russia, Prussia, and Austria all disagree. And um, so uh, in January of 1815, Kasserra, Metternich, and Talleyrand all sign a secret treaty pledging that they will go to war against Russia and Prussia if a compromise isn't found. And so in the settlement then, um, Russia is going to finally get what's called Congress Poland, um, where they do end up creating a kingdom of Poland, where um, the Tsar Alexander will be the king, and there will be a constitution present there. Um, however, this kingdom won't last more than about 15 years until it gets absorbed with Russia. And then Prussia receives two-fifths of Saxony. Um, in terms of um, compensations, for the land, as the desire was, if you can look at this map again. Um, Venetia and Lombardy, um, two areas in the Italian states, 
um, are going to be given to Austria. This is not nationalism at all, right? Just given to them to help acquire more power. Um, England is going to get, to get tons of colonies, um, particularly um, the Cape of Good Hope, which helps establish their claim over South Africa. And it's at this moment that they really expand and dominate over all of India. Um, it's also um, at this moment that England's going to uh, allow for, call for, um, let the Spanish Wars of Independence run their course, were not to intervene. Um, and so that was the hope of expanding more free trade. Um, and England also is going to maintain some um, islands um, within the Caribbean and that they took from France along with um, in the Indian Ocean. And so at this moment, England really has dominated the Indian Ocean in particular, and they're continuing to expand. Um, uh, Poland is going to be going to Russia, another example of how it's not nationalism. Um, and Belgium is going to be going to Holland, um, once again, not nationalistic or liberal, just unifying and creating a new monarchy. Um, and then Prussia gets the two-fifths of Saxony. Um, in terms of the restoration of legitimacy, um, the Bourbons are going to be reestablished into power, and that's an example of the, of the um, first treaty. Now, in terms of the German states, a German confederacy was set up to replace the old Holy Roman Empire. So I just want to explain a little bit more about how that German confederation is organized and how it's run. Um, the number of German states is going to be reduced from 300 during the Holy Roman Empire down to just 39. And there's going to be a diet established under the presidency of Austria where states were to send delegates. And each state was to be completely independent in terms of internal affairs, but any kind of war between the individual states is forbidden. And um, the consent of the Confederacy as a whole was necessary for any foreign war. So this is how it's a true Confederacy, where each state is independent, however, they are not to go to war with it within each other. Bavaria is going to be receiving um, Rhineish Bavaria, extending from the Prussian territory on the Rhine to Alsace, which includes the city of Mainz. And so Bavaria becomes sort of a second tier kingdom, um, second only to Prussia and Austria. So another more powerful area. Hanover II is going to begin gaining more power, um, is going to become a kingdom and receive each Frieza and Hildesheim. Um, Switzerland will be declared as a neutral state. The Kingdom of Piedmont is going to be restored in Italy and combined with the Republic of Genoa. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be one final alliance of sorts, along with the Quadruple Alliance, called the Holy Alliance, which was um, signed by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. It's a scheme that is viewed as genuine by Alexander I, um, however not genuinely agreed upon by the other powers where he asked all monarchs to sign a statement where they promised to uphold Christian principles of charity and peace. Um, he viewed that Christianity needed to be the underlying basis for all governments in Europe um, as a fo foundational um, aspect. Most other rulers at this point are moving away from having a church-based government and church-based society, and they start to view the separation of church and state as a source of strength. However, um, they do all sign, except for the Pope. Um, the Pope um, said, there's no way I can sign something where Protestants also are signing. Um, the Sultan, um, justifiably, he's Muslim, so it wouldn't make sense, along with um, Great Britain. Great Britain also does not sign it. He, um, they view it as a sublime piece of mysticism and nonsense. Um, but this holy alliance um, really upsets um, this new group of liberals who um, could have maybe put up with the establishment of the monarchies and the, and the desire for order and for protection of human rights. However, um, they view this against liberty and progress, a true step backwards in restoring religion back into this. Um, one final thing that's set up, um, so here you can see the Holy Alliance, those countries that are part of it. One final thing that's set up is the Concert of Europe. And this Concert of Europe was designed to preserve Vienna's Congress. Um, and so states are going to be meeting regularly. Um, it was called the Concert System, although they never truly met as a system organizedly, um, but they did feel that um, there should be agreed uh, meetings in order to stick together in times of peace before things get out of hand. 
Um, it was a gentleman's agreement, verbal. There was no formal constitution. Um, it was decided that um, when and where conflicts could lead to international war, they would then have a Congress to meet and talk it out first. And so it was all of this agreement that if there was a revolution occurring in a country, they wouldn't wait, they would immediately invade. And so we're going to now transition and talk about this Concert of Europe system. Um, and we're going to go through a few of these. So the first one, of course, is the Congress of Vienna. And so we'll be going over the following um, um, now. So the Concert of Europe was really designed to help preserve the Vienna settlement um, by maintaining balance of power, preventing revolution. Um, and it really helps um, us further set up um, and establish the um, the, the legacy that leads us to the modern day United Nations. Um, this in particular resembles the League of Nations. So when you consider the timeline of history, the League of Nations wasn't this novel, brand new, abstract idea post-World War I, but it's very much grounded with history. And so that's where we're going to be dwelling some time in the Concert of Europe. Um, so its first primary objectives were to contain France after de decades of war, achieve a balance of power between Europe's great powers, uphold the territorial arrangements made at the Congress of Vienna, and in doing so, really prevent the rise of another Napoleonesque figure, which would result in an, another continent-wide war. In this, historians have generally agreed that they were successful, as there was no major war pitting the great powers against each other until the Crimea War, 40 years later. And France was successfully reintegrated back into Europe, joining the alliance in 1818 at the Congress of Aix la chapelle However, after the success, the Concert of Europe gradually fell apart, mainly because of disagreements between the great powers, particularly between Britain and the countries with more conservative constitutions, who were also members of that holy alliance. Despite the overall failures of the Congress system, it marked an important step in European and world diplomacy. In its approximately 85 years of life, it had erected an imposing structure of international law. So at this Congress of um, A La Chapelle, um, it's marking the end of, of occup military occupation of France. Um, and banks are going to take over the reparations that, and France pays them the banks. Um, and so France, once again, it gets to be entered into a member of these alliances. And now the Quadruple Alliance will be known as the Quintuple Alliance. Um, and it's also in response to the revolutions that are happening in South Spanish America. In 1804, where there was the Haitian Revolution. In the 1820s, you're going to see Jose de San Martin and Simon Bolivar. And in 1881, 1821, I mean, um, Mexico also breaks out into revolution. And so um, Russia, Austria, and Prussia are concerned about the potential spread of these revolutions. However, um, Britain is arguing um, that in order to preserve the balance of power, um, it's, there's no real need to suppress these revolutions. Um, Britain's really interested in the benefits that it potentially gain for, through trade. And so this we see the development of some real politique where Britain's going to insist that we leave Latin America alone in the interest of, um, of national self-interest. It's also in that same mindset that we're going to see the groundings for the um, the Monroe Doctrine later on that England's really um, backing, um, backing up the United States with, as long with Latin America, trying to sort of maintain its trade trade negotiations. Um, in two years after this first um, Congress of Aix la Chapelle in 1820, we're going to see the Congress of Troupeau. And the Congress of Troupeau is really caused um, because of revolutions in Spain. Um, along with the uprisings of two Sicilies. Um, there was uh, the clash of Cadiz and Ferdinand VII of Spain. Uh, legitimacy for these areas meant a return to the old regime arist um, aristocrats, and they were happy to get back their old privileges. Um, however, there's a small minority of middle-class intellectuals who are going to be dissenting. And so in 1812, a liberal middle class is writing up the Constitution of 1812, limiting the power of the monarch and increasing the power of the, courts, the court system. Um, and the Bourbon, Ferdinand VII, is going to be suspending the Constitution, dissolving the court system, and trying to stop the rebellions in the colonies. So the, um, the meeting in, uh, in 1820 is really revolving around, uh, around all these different crises. Ferdinand VII then becomes a prisoner. 
in Portugal and the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, there's another uprising um, led by um, the Carbonari, a secret national society in Italy, is going to be leading that resistance. And all of this is going to lead to a triple alliance of conservatism where leaders will meet a troupeau in Zalaysia in 1820. Um, and they're going to set up the Troupeau Protocol where Russia, Austria, and Prussia will declare war on revolutionary governments. And this is sort of a formal um, institution where they're then going to intervene on any kind of revolutionary movements. In, um, in 1821, the Congress of Liebach is when Austria is going to intervene in Sicily and Naples in order to restore um, the, the, the king there. In 1822, we have the Congress of Verona, and that one is grounded in the revolution in Greece. Greece is looking to fight for emancipation from the Turkish overlords, and they, because of their Slavic connections with Russia, look for Russia to intervene and to support them. And so the first outbreak against the Turks was actually back in 1804 among some Serbs, and Serbia is going to be gaining the support of Russia and succeed by 1830 to become an autonomous um, country under the Serb um, Turkish domain. So Serbia is not completely independent from the Ottoman Empire, but it does gain some freedoms. Um, Russia is interested in helping Greece. Um, as part of this revolution um, because they've used the Balkan Peninsula as a potential puppet state for it. Remember, Russia's always goal is to have a warm water port, and the Black Sea is a critical source for them to be. It's the only um, warm water access that they have year-round. And so um, the first outbreak, again, uh, so, so Greece is going to be viewed as an, the next extension for Russia's um, puppet state. However, of course, this would be a threat to the other powers and the balance of powers. So um, Greece is going to launch their own campaigns for independence um, starting in the early 1820s. Um, they're trying to purge the Turkish and Slavic words from their language. They set up their, uh, their own secret society at the Russian port of Odessa. Um, and Britain, France, and Russia together are going to intervene in order to save Greek independence. Now, this does not necessarily add up with the rest of the Congress system. Why are they supporting a revolution in Greece when they're suppressing revolutions everywhere else? Um, and Metternich actually wanted to put um, these rebellions down because he believed that if they succeeded, it would let different Austrian ethnic groups believe they could gain independence. However, um, because of the Ottoman Empire's connection um, and, and, and the other countries viewing the Ottoman Empire as a threat, um, countries are more willing to, um, to join in in this campaign. And so in 1828, there's going to be a treaty called the Treaty of Andronopoli, which give Russia some Turkish territory and Greeks are going to form a small independent kingdom. Most Greeks are still a part of the Ottoman Empire. Nationalism and liberalism is, is in general lost, um, and Russia sort of established it's a protector of orthodoxy in the Balkan region. Um, and it's, it's, it, the war of Greek independence is very much a movement of romanticism throughout the rest of Europe, um, particularly in England and in France, where this movement called romanticism, this art and um, this art movement and literary movement, um, this war becomes one where the, the idea of dying for a cause and preserving the Western roots of civilization against uh, Ottomans becomes really attractive. And so you have um, uh, people, figures like Lord Byron um, of England, who um, goes to help, help fight for the cause of independence. And here he is dressed in traditional folk Greek clothing. He is not Greek in any way, shape, or form, but he views it as this romantic source. Now, um, at this moment, too, um, the, the French Bourbon family is going to intervene in Spain, um, where they're going to be restoring Ferdinand VII to the Spanish throne. Um, and this ends the alliance, um, the quadruple alliance, because Britain um, is going to be afraid of any intervention in the Americas um, by France. They're afraid that France and the Bourbon connections with Ferdinand VII are not going to reinvade and get involved with the Spanish colonies, trying to re reconnect those those powers. And so they end up back up backing up the United States, as I had mentioned earlier, 
with the Monroe Doctrine, um, and this is passed in 1823, which closes the Western Hemisphere. And it's also with this move that England pretty much um, withdraws itself from continental affairs in Europe, trying to sort of remain as a global international power, um, protecting its own imperial goals, rather than worrying about and getting drawn into the conflicts that are happening in Europe. Now, the Greek War of Independence marks an important point um, of decline for the Congress system, because there's now no longer England, uh, there's greater, there's less unity, and generally the dismantling of the first empire, the Ottoman Empire. And so they're unable to stand for anything but the status quo. So they're just sort of seeking to maintain what's there, rather than really standing by any kind of principles. The Congress at St. Petersburg um, it occurs, but it's very weak. Um, Alexander I has suppressed nationalist and liberal movements. Russia at this time is really facing quite a few challenges. Um, throughout Russian set territories after 1815, there's been these new secret societies that are meeting, um, calling for different kinds of reforms. So there's one group called the Northern Society um, that is made up of actually high-ranking officers in St. Petersburg. They're much more moderate, they want Russia to be a limited, decentralized monarchy with provinces that had rights similar to American states, so a decentralized United States setup. Um, they want to free serfs but not allow serfs to own any land, so they're calling for different kinds of reforms. Um, uh, the Southern Society um, is made up of a lot of impoverished uh, officers that were in Kiev, so in the southern portions of the Russian Empire. Um, they call for a much more highly centralized republic, um, but still a republic nonetheless. They also call for freedom of the serfs, but they want to have the serfs hold land to be able to own territory. Alexander I is going to die in 1825, and this is going to cause a lot of confusion um, because there were two brothers um, who could become czar. The older brother, Constantine, relinquished his rights and gave his rights of, of claim to the throne, to the imperial throne, to his younger brother, Nicholas. Um, many viewed this as an Ill Ill illegitimate thing. When you're first born, you should become the king, you should be the ruler. And so northern and southern societies viewed this as an opportunity to demand reforms. And this is going to lead to the Decemberist revolts. Um, which is which occurs in St. Peter's Square, St. Petersburg, and it's the first attempt to overthrow absolutist regime in Russia for political goals of reform. Um, it's made up of, the December's revolt was made up of an influential group um, conceived of Russian state separate, um, separate and distinct from the ruler. Um, this revolt uh, was a complete failure. It was disorganized, uh, men were arrested and executed, uh, but the writings of these leaders of the revolt are going to be preserved and passed down and read and studied and modeled for future revolutions, including the revolutions of 1905 and then um, that of, of Lenin. Um, so as these failed congresses are occurring, you know, the, the values that were originally set out are getting lost. Um, so as the conservative order withdrew from dominating international politics, revolutions broke out um, throughout Europe. And so this is really paving our way. We ended in 18, um, 1825 was the last of these Congress meetings. Um, we're going to see widespread revolutions in 1830 and then again in much larger scale in 1848. Um, and then this breakdown of the Congress of uh, a Concert of Europe is going to open up for even bigger changes in the shift of the map of Europe um, with the unification of Germany and Italy. Um, so the rise of new nationalism and liberal reforms elsewhere. Um, what ultimately really opens up these different movements was um, the Crimean War, which is used as the marker to really mark the end of all of these revolutions.